Thank you, Madam Speaker. Last week, as we are all too aware, a gunman opened members of Congress and staff assistance as they were practicing for the annual bipartisan baseball game to raise money for a Washington-based charity. Among those who were injured was, is my dear friend and colleague, Congressman Steve Scalise, the House Majority Whip. As news of this event came in right before our weekly Nebraska breakfast, a 74-year tradition, by the way, bipartisan tradition in which the entire Nebraska delegation gets together on a weekly basis and invites anyone from our home state to gather with us. As that was about to occur, I heard the news of the shootings. I felt bewildered, shocked, numb. And as further reports came in from my colleagues throughout the morning, I heard that Steve was playing second base at the time of his shooting. He crawled from the infield, leaving a trail of blood. Mr. Speaker, this isn't a movie. These are not distant figures. These are our friends, our colleagues, people who work right here in this institution. Representative Scalise and I frequently interact on the nuances of policy and sometimes differences of policy. And no matter what our disagreements, and believe me, there are hard differences even on one side of the political aisle, no matter what the differences might be, Steve always has worked with me in a cordial, professional, constructive, and perhaps most importantly, gentlemanly manner. That's just who he is. So regardless of what anyone may think of his policies, of his political point of view, Congress or the GOP, he did not deserve to be shot. As noted by Senator Rand Paul, who was also at the practice, were it not for the courageous United States Capitol police officers who accompanied Representative Scalise to events, this would have been a massacre were it not for the first responders from the Alexandria Police Department and Fire and Rescue, many of those injured, for them it could have been much, much worse. My heart goes out to Steve Scalise and the others who are injured in this tragic event. However, my words cannot stop here. For years now, across, across multiple administrations, across party lines, we have seen accelerating political rancor in our country that goes, goes way beyond normal partisan politics. It's hard to get your mind around some of the stuff that people write. It's awful. And it goes beyond just pointed language. It's now so frequent, so violent, and so directly threatening that security personnel are working overtime to keep up with it. Mr. Speaker, you know this. Many good men and women of differing political perspectives work in the United States Congress. These are people who have accomplished important things in their own home communities and decided that their heart was calling them to serve in a broader capacity. Now, I fully recognize that Washington, D.C. can seem elitist and aloof but as you know, Mr. Speaker, members of Congress are real people with real families from real places across our land. Now, sure, there may be a disproportionate share of lawyers in the institution, but there are also nurses and social workers and doctors and teachers, small business owners. In fact, one of the doctors, Representative Brad Winstrup, a friend of mine, happened to be at the baseball practice, an Iraq war veteran, a surgeon, and he tended to Steve Scalise's gunshot wound, thankfully. Above all, Mr. Speaker, above all, all of these persons are Americans. Nevertheless, there is a limit to what the human person, even a paid public servant, can absorb. We can take the violent words, but when it spills into violent action, it's too much. This country cannot continue to rip itself apart like this.
Madam Speaker, there is one additional difficulty here that needs to be unpacked. There is a real risk and vulnerability in what I call regularizing this response, in, in making it like a new normal. In fact, with only a few, within only a few hours of the shootings, certain national media had begun to routinize the tragedy as they returned to obsessing on the latest crisis du jour in Washington, as if nothing fundamentally destructive to all that we hold dear to, as Americans had just occurred. And why not? Because as the media tells us, the assassin was, quote, a troubled man, a lone wolf with a history of violence and easy access to guns who was likely mentally ill. Nothing unique to see here. Madam Speaker, these were not our thoughts after the assassination attempt on Ronald Reagan or the shooting of Democrat Congresswoman, Arizona Congresswoman Gabby Giffords of Arizona. When President Kennedy was shot, I am told, it was as if the entire world came to a halt. If we are now going to move beyond words and normalize the, the violent targeting of people just because they choose, to cho they choose public service or hold views that are different from our own or speak in a style that is not to our liking, then there is no country. And I find it particularly jarring that the widely play, praised theatrical assassination of President Trump at a rendition of Julius Caesar in New York's Central Park, underwritten, by the way, by the New York Times, continues to go on. Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, look, violence is violence. When it's here and it's political, of course, it's particularly jarring. But tragically, we also may be growing used to the idea of terror abroad. Although its root causes are different than those domestic political attacks here on our own shores, the same thing is at stake. It's the very principles of civilization itself. Madam Speaker, I, let me digress for a moment because this is particularly notable. After 9-11, crime all but vanished from the streets of New York City. In other words, the shock and the horror caused a community to rally together above any social discord in a spirit of true unity. And we glimpsed, we glimpsed that same spirit of solidarity as a nation when Osama bin Laden was finally confronted. And just recently, a few days, a day after the terror attacks that rocked London a few weeks ago, Richard Angel, a, a, a patron in a restaurant that had been evacuated during the jihadist rampage, he calmly returned to pay his bill. In explaining his generosity, Angel told a reporter, quote, these people shouldn't win. The night before, several bartenders had risked their lives to defend patrons in that particular establishment with bottles and chairs and tables, anything they could find as the terrorists tried to hack away their customers with large knives. More lives would have been lost were it not for their bravery. And only a few weeks before that, at a concert attended mostly by young girls, a homeless man, Stephen Jones, who slept most nights near the stadium, helped several victims of that bombing to safety, even pulling nails from the faces of young children. This resolve and courage in the face of barbaric violence harkens back to the passengers aboard United Flight 93 who sacrificed their own lives on 9-11 in order to take down a plane headed straight to Washington, D.C., probably for the White House. And while we appropriately recognize those who act with courage, the constant repetition 
of these scenes appears to be resulting sadly in what I call terror fatigue. We go about the same tired ritual, the requisite shock and horror, the 24-hour media coverage of victims and heroes and family and the inevitable autopsy, autopsy of what went wrong. By this exercise, I'm afraid we, we further enable what Hannah Arendt once famously wrote, the banality of evil. And against this backdrop, I think it's important, useful to pull back and contemplate the fundamental error in our analysis and approach. In the West, we have a blind spot. We want to believe that if we can only understand how a disordered person was raised, how his parents treated him, if he was an orphan or poor or misunderstood or abandoned or a victim of some real or imagined prejudice, then we can understand what makes him kill. And armed with this soft understanding, perhaps we can prevent further tragedy by ameliorating the conditions that we think gave rise to barbaric deeds. In many discussions of unpredictable and random attack on bystanders in Europe and America, we find a perverse unwillingness to accurately identify the true motivations of perpetrators, lest we lose this space to cure them of their zealotry. And in this current highly politicized, polarized, oversensitized, and extremely volatile climate, it is risky to call a thing for what it is. Instead, again and again, we hear that these were just a few misguided individuals. Another mental health problem, another aberration, another police problem. Nothing to do with dark theology to notice here. Carry on. We must just accept this as a new normal. But what makes these particular vicious actors different? The Gallup organization, in a, in a study, basically finds that most people in the world want similar things. Most people in the world want a good job, be able to take care of themselves, be take, able to take care of their family, to be able to use the creative talents of their personhood, whether it be their intellect or their hands, to make things for the benefit of others and in turn receive an income that they can support themselves with. However, as one of my Muslim friends has noted, Petro-Islam has un enabled and unleashed a narrow sect of, Mus of men and women who often want for nothing. Several of the terrorists on 9-11 were young men of both wealth and privilege with world-class educations. They weren't motivated by the allures of Western secular materialism. They used those values to hide in plain sight. Rather, they were in the grip of a dark, violent theology. They were willing to die for its inherent irrationality. This cannot continue. Even the Saudis, who have lived for too long with the hyper-hypocrisy of buying off Wahhabist while shopping in Paris, recognize this is an unsustainable trend. Madam Speaker, when I was in college, I remember the day when Egyptian President Anwar Sadat was assassinated. It was a hard day for me. Shortly before, I had lived in that country on a exchange program, and it received the bountiful gift of hospitality and an invaluable source of deep and rich cultural understanding. Sadat died. Sadat gave his life because he made a reasoned choice to reach across the divide to find peace. And in another courageous move, just a few years ago, in a little-known speech, the current Egyptian president, Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, said, quote, is it possible that 1.6 billion Muslims 
should want to kill the rest of the world's inhabitants, that is 7 billion, so that they, may say, they may, themselves may live? Impossible. Quite a courageous statement. At this moment, Madam Speaker, we are on the verge of wiping out ISIS militarily. But it's only the latest brand. We will only fully resolve the thinking that leads to the embrace of dark theology through a rebirth of reason, modeled through courageous leadership. As we see in our battle against ISIS, when you call evil for evil to happen on social media, in Main Street media, and in art, someone eventually in the real world takes it to heart. We must stop creating the rhetorical conditions and the media cover for this politically motivated violence or the grotesque twisting of mediums to encourage terror. There is no rationalization that can justify it. And this is not about the freedom of speech. It is about the freedom from violence. Ask yourself a question. Where would you like to live? Where people lie, steal, and kill? Or where people are good, trustworthy, and free. Madam Speaker, I'll close with this because it's a hint of good news. Last week, the House of Representatives in a private session, Democrats and Republicans, had a family meeting and with due candor spoke about the effect of escalating rhetoric and the responsibility each of us must take in owning our share of it. And importantly, the bipartisan congressional baseball game went on as planned last Thursday night. I took my younger staff. The game was energetic and patriotically bipartisan. Madam Speaker, as you are aware, my side lost. But I believe America won. I yield.